Welcome to Sex Talk with Kelly. I invite you to spend the next 30 minutes embracing your sexuality and exploring your edges. Tonight, we're meeting with the dream team, Vanessa and Melissa, to talk about how to keep things hot and heavy while raising a young family. We are then moving into talking about gender and gender identity with Dr. BJ Rye, and then we will be climaxing the show with talking about vacation sex with an urban spa retreat with Carly from The Waters. Let's get this sexy show on the road. with Melissa and Vanessa, the dream team Hi. here. Oh, Thank you're so, so sweet. much for being on the show. Thanks for having us. Oh my yeah. gosh, I can only repay the pay, uh, repay the favor because you guys have had me on your show and it was such a pleasurable experience. Uh, well, we so. love having you on because you're like the expert in sex, yeah. right? And we need tips on sex. Well, well. I think it's like, moms right like we kind of can fall well I can fall to the side with the sex life and it was nice to have someone mm. come in and reaffirm the things that we're doing or that we should be doing yeah and sex is normal and it's healthy yes. right? and it's an important part of a relationship and we're all doing it so why don't we talk about it more really are it's we very all natural it? well are uh, we all doing and it? and that's the question <laughs> I mean, we should all be doing it <laughs> well, tell me about how you support other moms like you guys disseminate a ton of information to make sure that people are having thriving lives and being able to do it all while raising happy happy family so how do you guys stay connected to your partners or offer suggestions to the people that you're coaching or mentoring it is something we like to bring up often because yeah. we feel like when you are connected to your partner and when you do have a healthy active sex life everything else is better it's mm -hmm. like that ripple effect right? right when you're not connected to your partner like you are not as patient with your kids like if you ha if you aren't sexually fulfilled it's the other pieces don't fit as well. So if we just get short. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we like to talk to our, our community and our moms and like find out how they find time and we like to share our suggestions in finding time, mm -hmm. which is something we're always working on. Yeah, and I think it's also um, important to understand that everyone has their own way to be intimate, right? And yes. So whereas even between the two of us, we're quite different. <laughs> this, right? is a, this is actually, yeah, an interesting topic because we are really different when mm -hmm. it comes to. Yeah, our need I'm like for intimacy. touchy feely, yeah. and she's like, find the bathroom stall and shut the doors. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I do like intimate relations with my husband as well. I'm just saying, I, I like to be intimate often. Yeah. It's yeah. a need for me. To me, I equate love with physical intimacy with my husband, and that's just how I am. Mm -hmm. And some people aren't don't need that as much. For me, right. it's really important. So, and I know there's a lot of people out there who do need it the way I do. So, mm -hmm. and it's hard to find that time with kids. So, we try to share our tips, like like where like places you can find that have a lock on the door, okay. like the washroom, locations in the home that are safe and good right. that the children aren't going to interrupt you, and right. also like really planning it. You know, like we prioritize the gym because we both love working out. Mm -hmm. So, in our calendar, we know when we're going to the gym and. Being intimate with your partner is just as important, and you need to pri prioritize it the same way, right? So, although it doesn't sound romantic, we schedule it sometimes because we need to. Like, I know, you know, Friday he's gonna have the day off, and I'm like, I know what's happening on Friday. Right. Like, right. And it's such a. <laughs> I love how quiet you are. Yeah, right. right. I'm just gonna sit here and agree. <laughs> Not that I don't have releases, right? You have to have. I stuff. was saying actually, yeah. she's only yeah. She's, she's yeah, always well. She's only been intimate three times, so. <laughs> Something keeps happening every time. Every time. She's very lucky. So fertile. <laughs> no, but I think that you're touching on an important thing. By planning it, you're also yeah. giving yourself enough time and to warm up to it or to have a really nice experience versus yeah. just the quickies here and there, which can be fun. Yes. But if you know it's planned, you're like, okay, what do I need to do for myself to get myself into that mood? So then I know that that's going to be a really nice, pleasurable, intimate experience. Yeah. Right? And that's the other thing. I think as busy, tired moms, a lot, a lot of the times we're not in the mood. Mm -hmm. We are not. And so our partners aren't in the mood either. They're tired. So like, how how do we instigate the romance and the intimacy when we're all exhausted and not into it? And sometimes just the act of actually like starting it, starting mm -hmm. the process, touching each other, you know, creates the want for it. What is the number one tip you could leave us with in terms of how to uh, create some time for yourself or create some time with your partner to make sure it is on the priority list? Like, what's the number one thing you share with moms? I think jump on it when you're feeling it. When yeah, you're feeling it. Yeah, yeah, jump on it when you're feeling it, and also. Even if you're not in the mood, start start the process of it because the act of just doing it gets you in the mood. Totally. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for being thank here, ladies. Thank you for having us. Hey, tell us where we can all find you. Okay. I know right here on Rogers with yeah. your show. But you can find us on Rogers, but you can find us online.
online at vanessaandmelissa.com and on every social channel as Vanessa and Melissa, including YouTube. Yeah. We are all over the place. And it's up on the screen. All right, thanks so much for being here. Stick around, we'll be right back with more. Welcome back. I am so excited to introduce you a local sexuality guru, Dr. BJ Rai. She is an associate professor at St. Jerome's College at University of Waterloo. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I really wanted to dive into the concept of sex, uh, sexual identity and how mm -hmm. that is formulated, how people can get to know themselves a bit better that way. Yeah, a lot of people uh, mistake sexual identity as just one thing. Mm -hmm. They talk about it as sexual orientation. Mm -hmm. But it's so much more than that. And people often conflate or confuse sexual, sexual identity and gender identity. Right. Um, so when I'm talking about it in class, I do like to start out with some basic concepts. What is sex? What is gender? And w we often use our bodies to, to try and figure out who we are gender-wise, sexual-wise, and so students I say, are you a man or a woman? Right. And they say, well, I'm a woman. Well, why are you a woman? Mm. They'll say, well, I have breasts and uh, a vulva and a vagina. Oh, okay, so what happens if um, I were in the Star Trek world and I could change you with this man over here? And now you have his body, but who you are, psychologically, your thoughts, your brain, are now in his body. Are you still a woman? Well, yes. Why? Well, because I feel that way. Mm -hmm. And I say, so that's your gender identity. Mm -hmm. okay. That's a really powerful way to do that, yes. to walk people through that process, to yes. have a deeper understanding. And the students are often embarrassed or mm -hmm. um, laugh about it, So, but they, they tend to play along with it. But yeah. So that's sort of how we explain gender identity to people. Mm -hmm. But sexual identity is, again, as I said, people tend to mistake it for sexual orientation or only talk about sexual orientation. Oh, I'm attracted to women, or I'm attracted to men, or I'm attracted to both men and women, mm -hmm. or I'm attracted to everyone. Mm -hmm. You know, it's about the person and not about, about the body. Uh, but the, the thing is that there are other things that go into our sexual identity. Sexual self-esteem, are you a good lover, mm. okay? Is it really important to you to be in a sexual relationship? What are your sexual preferences? Mm -hmm. um, you know, do you prefer blondes, tall people, short people, older people, younger people? What are your sexual needs? Um, how do you think about yourself as a sexual person? So there's all kinds of components that uh, feed into we, it. We really need to think about when we think about sexual identity, right. all of it. It's such a broad concept, mm -hmm. and I find through just my work that mm -hmm. not a lot of people have taken the time to sit mm -hmm. down and unpack some of the, that stuff for themselves, mm -hmm. to really get to know themselves in, with all those different components. Yes, I, I agree a lot, and a lot of my research takes me in, into uh, those domains. So I, yeah, any findings that you can share with us from, a, a, she, okay, she sent her list of journal pub <laughs> publications and there were a ton of them, so mm. any, anything you want to share with us today that really like piqued your interest or that would be really valuable for people to know? Well, uh, I've spent a, a good deal of time looking at differences between different groups, so are men and women really different? Yeah. Uh, do you know how people say, oh, well, uh, men are from Mars and women are from Venus? Um, I usually say John Gray, who, who wrote that book, is from Uranus. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, one of the things that I'm doing right now mm -hmm. with a couple of students, one student's from Laurier and um, one's an undergraduate at, at the University of Waterloo, is looking at sexual self-concept, yeah. self-schema, sexual identity, and are there gender differences? Mm -hmm. And our preliminary research says no, men and women aren't that different. Mm -hmm. In, in those domains. And so people would predict, oh, well, men are very, very different. I mean, there's a few differences here and there, uh, but there's not as many as you might think. And one of my other studies, an earlier study, looked at intersex women intersex versus um, gay or bisexual women, lesbian or, or bisexual women, and heterosexual women who are biologically typical. Intersex women are women who are uh, Phenologically, they look like females, but they have some 
physical characteristics that are males. Right. So you might know the earlier word, uh, hermaphrodite. hermaphrodite yeah. uh, so hermaphrodite and intersex. Uh, and I looked at the sexual self schemas and sexual self concepts of those three groups and found some interesting differences and some, some similarities. What are the interesting differences? Uh, well, for example, the, um, the heterosexual women and the, the uh, lesbian and bisexual women tended to sort of feel better about themselves sexually than the intersex women. Okay. And one of the things that I, I noticed in more qualitative component of the survey that we administered was that the intersex women were really grateful that they had a place to talk about their sexuality. Mm. Nobody talked with them about their sexuality. And that's an older study. And there's a study I'm doing right now with a student mm -hmm. on transgender men, trans oh. men. Okay, so these are men who were born biologically female, yep. but live as men. Okay. okay. And some of them have transitioned to be biologically uh, aligned, aligned with, with um, as masculine as they can be and so forth. Anyway, the one thing that, that came out of that study as well is that a lot, of them, a lot of the trans men were saying, you know what, nobody's ever asked us about our sexuality. Mm. They ask us about our body and, and, and so forth, but not our psychological sexuality. And sexual identity. Yeah. Yeah, I want to mm -hmm. keep this conversation going, so we are going to be right back after this short break. Welcome back. We are here with Dr. B.J. Rai, and she has filled us in on a ton of information. All right, I want to ask you a question around what do you think contributes to the attitudes towards BDSM it's people? A good, it's a good question because I am taking uh, some research to the Canadian Psychological Association Convention um, in in this upcoming year. Right. So uh, one of the things that I've been interested in is attitudes toward attitudes towards different sexual groups, if you will. So I, I looked at attitudes towards people who practice BDSM. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I found is that there weren't gender differences. Men and women weren't, weren't different in their attitudes. And looking at a university sample, people were kind of moderate in their attitudes. Mm -hmm. They weren't overly negative. They weren't overly positive. Okay. And I'm also looking at uh, a sample of people from sort of the general population, an internet sample from the United States. But one of the things that's really emerged for me yeah. was that there are two key predictors out of a variety of predictors of attitudes towards BDSM. And, and one of the best predictors is something that's called erotophobia, erotophilia. Erotophobia and erotophilia. Yeah. Can you yeah. define what, those, what that means? Sure. Uh, think about it as a continuum. Okay. Okay. A continuum of, of comfort, uh, comfort with sexuality. So erotophilia are people who are really comfortable, okay. and erotophobia are people who are really uncomfortable okay. with sexuality, with sexual topics. So it's thought to be a dimension of personality. Mm -hmm. And again, so that, that ties in with sexual identity. How comfortable are you with sexuality, with sexual topics, your sexuality, other sexuality, sexual unusual topics, sexual usual topics. So uh, erotophobia, erotophilia, is thought to be this somewhat stable dimension of, of personality. And it's a really good predictor of attitudes towards people who practice BDSM. It's a good predictor of attitudes towards lesbian, gays, bisexuals, transgender people, okay. attitudes towards a whole bunch of sexual topics. Um, and it's independent uh, somewhat of religiosity. So okay. when I try to predict attitudes toward people who practice BDSM, mm -hmm. I find that both of them predict unique amounts of, of attitudes. Mm -hmm. I don't want to get statistical on you. Not too mm -hmm. statistical, yeah. but enough just to keep us interested. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so tell us more about the findings specifically towards BDSM. Like what are, where do they lie in that continuum? So the more erotophilic people are, the more comfortable they were reading about someone who practiced BDSM. Okay. So it, it tends to be in that kind of realm. I kind of 
like to think of it uh, as the show. Did you ever watch Sex in the City? Yes. Which was a great big, as you know from the sex, sexology conferences, people talk about Sex in the City as sort of a seminal kind of television show that mm -hmm. brought mm, sort of middle-aged women's sex to the forefront or, or a little bit older women's sexuality to the forefront. And there were some characters on there and there was one who's very erotophilic, we call Samantha. Yeah. So I always give her as an example because most people, students, have, have seen a couple of those uh, episodes. Or Charlotte, she was kind of more conservative, uncomfortable with sexuality. Right. So. so you would say yeah. that's sort yeah. of the spectrum. Those are kind of the spectrum, although Charlotte was right. probably moderately comfortable right you know. okay because really people who are terribly erotophobic they don't they they're not watching this show right uh, they won't pick up the textbook they c enter my course and realize what it's about and leave do you know much about why people become so phobic or well, like what what's going on there uh, I I have I have some understanding that it's really something that we learn right so a lot of messages are given to us from society, mm -hmm. uh, particularly about, about sexuality very early on. I, I was speaking to you about uh, the sociologist Jean Kilborn earlier, right. and she was talking about the sexualization of children. Mm -hmm. and you can go on to her TED talk and hear her speak, and she talks about the sexualization of children right from the get-go. Right. And s there are these messages, you've got to be sexy, particularly for girls. You've got to be sexy, but you're also basically a, a tramp, right. if you are. So it's this conundrum that we put girls in, in Kids, particular. like teens, yeah. young people. And, and don't think it's just a, a walk in the park for boys. They've, you know, they've got to be ready all the time. They're, they want sex all the time they should be striving for it all the time yeah. and that's a lot of pressure for boys and men what if they don't want sex right so. is something wrong with them yes. and yeah. so we get these messages really early on mm -hmm. and then there's also the messages we get sociologically from uh, religion from medicine mm -hmm. from the law mm -hmm. you know wh why is being married to more than one person a bad thing it's illegal you can, only, you can only marry one person at a time. Right. But one of the questions is, well, why? Right. Loving, consensual adults? As long as they're adults. So we don't want to conflate it with coercion or child sexual right. abuse. But if you had, let's say you had uh, two partners and you wanted to marry them. So why do we have a law against that? Right. It's just a question to ask. Yeah, exactly. I'm not... I'm not in favor, I'm not against. It's just Curious. these are the, these are the kind of questions that we like to ask. And in they our feed into people's classes. willingness to be open, willing to be open, mm -hmm. or they're fearful, right? That's right. Well, this has been so enlightening and informative, mm -hmm. and I really appreciate you taking the time to be here and share mm -hmm. your knowledge with us today. So, if people want to get in touch with you, how can they reach you? I'm at the University of Waterloo at St. Jerome's University, which is a federated university with the University of Waterloo, mm -hmm. and uh, you can email me. Okay, and that her information should be up on the screen. Okay. Okay, thank you again. Thank you. And stay tuned, we'll be right back for more.